All right, what do you want to do? Um, all right, my name is Katie Hill, and I'm here with Mr. Thomas Collins. I'm going to interview him. Um, the date is January 2nd, 2004, and we're going to begin. All right, um, do you remember when you were drafted? I was drafted on July 2nd, 1942. I went to Camp Upton on Long Island, where they processed me. I was there about a week, I, if I remember right. From there, we went to the ship on the natural two train to Oklahoma, where in Muscogee, Oklahoma, Camp Kruger, where we were the first contingent of draft age to arrive there at that camp. The camp was brand new. It was the 88th Division, just forming. It was with the first group that went there. And I was picked to go in the artillery. And I spent a year there. And they trained us. We were, we were, the whole division was trained. Right from scratch, we were the first all drafty division in the Second World War, and we were, we were trained there until this time we went on maneuvers to Louisiana, uh, the summer of '43, and uh, that took about a month. San Antonio. Uh, That's a camp there. <laughs> but the big camp in San Antonio, I can't think of the name of it now. But uh, there we were just more or less processed. We got our teeth fixed and everything, if anything was wrong with us, and we got issued everything to bring us up to the bar on, on clothing and equipment and so on. And from there, we took another train ride to Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, and from there we shipped out to have a very unpleasant ride, 23 days from there to Orient, North Africa. And we ride there, and I believe, in October. Okay, so, um, do you remember, what did you do when you were in Africa? In Africa, the war had already progressed through Sicily, and they were just getting into Italy. They had just taken Naples, and were just a very short distance above Naples. And we just... There we trained more or less, got used to the countryside and that, uh, brought our equipment again. Uh, our guns were howitzers, were shipped to us. Uh, some of them were in the same convoy we were in and some of them weren't. But we finally got everything together. We had to make sure all our equipment was in tip that shape. And we were there. We maybe arrived in October. These are guesses, give or take a couple weeks or something in there. And we left there about a month later, November or early December. And we went from there, it took us seven days across the Mediterranean to, uh, and we landed in Naples. I remember in Naples, it was quite fascinating and terrifying, you know, in a way. But we went into the harbor, and it was 
and shifts all over the place. We pulled up alongside a capsized ship. I don't know if it was American or what, but they had taken the superstructure right off it so we could come right up to the, to the ship. We got off on a gangplank onto the side of the ship and another bank, bank, gangplank onto the shore. That was, a, that was our pier. Went from there, and about a month later, or three weeks later, we were on the line. Um, do you do you remember the first time you came in um, contact with a, a German soldier? Did you ever? Uh, you had actual contact? contact with the German soldier. Remember, now I was in the artillery, mm -hmm. and we were as close as two miles, a mile and a half, to the front lines of the infantry, or as much as eight miles behind them. Our guns would fire a maximum 14 miles. And we, we would, if we moved up and got close to the infantry, as they moved, Sometimes they moved right away, sometimes it was, took quite a while for them to get the control. Mm -hmm. And as they moved, we stayed there where we were because we had everything, uh, pieces laid, you know, uh, so we knew where we were firing, where we were, uh, what targets we were hitting, you know. Mm -hmm. um, then, if, when we got to where we were stretching our, our range, then we moved. And we had to coordinate it with the infantry. If we moved up, they had to kind of wait for us. You know, in other words, unless it was a, a terrible situation, you know, a, a rapidly changing situation, we moved on up minutes notice and, and find a place to, uh, to to put our guns in position uh, just off the, off the cuff, so to speak, wherever we could get and find a good spot. We, we got it and uh, we'd be there sometimes two hours and then move again. But German soldiers, this is a question. I didn't actually see any German soldiers until the war was almost over. And then, by that time, they were surrendering uh, you know, all the time. We go pull into a field uh, and to set up our guns, and all of a sudden, there'd be two or three of them saying that they comrade, comrade. They, they were more or less waiting for us, I think, that they wanted to make sure the infantry got by them because we weren't as good. Me as a unit, deservedly so, understandably, because the infantry had, and, and they had crutches, which uh, we didn't have so much. Um, what about Italian civilians? Did you ever encounter them? Oh, yes. A lot of, most of the time, We were, uh, we put our guns in position wherever we could in a farmyard or uh, close to a, a, a settlement like that where we could use the building as camouflage. We set our gun up uh, alongside the a building, then put our, our uh, camouflage that from the barn over our gun and put the posts over here to hold the posts in the center. And that way, it, from the air, our, what we were trying to do was to make our position look like an extension of the, of the barn, like part of the barn. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. 
were they ever like did you ever see one on the street and were they scared of you like did they ever yeah, the, the, the civilians yeah ah uh, they weren't they weren't afraid of us they weren't and we saw them all the time but we'd be in their gun positions in their farm yards mm -hmm. they got used to get quite upset with this speed especially in the warm weather that was at the time and times when times are kind of fluid we were moving the equipment we pull into a farm yard and the cannoneers on the back of my truck the chickens are running the cannoneers are going pop 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 but they could move with their rifles and can't get up and put them out with their sharp rifles uh, and uh, the guineas used to go crazy because we were killing their chickens and they think we could set up a position, they'd take the chickens and pluck them and gut them and put them up in the nest yet. They were good too. Um, what, what did you do for food when you didn't have chickens to shoot? Well, we had, we were, see, the fortunate ones, because we had our mess truck that traveled right with us. Um, most of the time, the mess truck was able to stay close enough to us where they could set up a chow line. And they'd be undercover somewhere alongside a building or something, and we'd go a man or two at a time to, to uh, stay undercover and get your chow and bring it back and sit in the bushes or something. That to, to eat. We had pretty good food. And except when it was really, when we were really in a turmoil and moving fast and, and uh, things were real rough, then they couldn't get to us. And they'd bring up uh, the sea rations and the K rations where we had to open a can and just eat it when the real good. Um, what was going through your mind during your first? experience in combat? Fear. Fear? Fear. 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 But, uh, I was in charge of the gun crew, the holocaust and the gun crew, and we were getting shelled, and our infantry was getting pounded, and we had the fear, but we were so busy, to do and make sure it got done, that it sort of, uh, it beat the fear. In other words, you were scared to death, but you still did your work as best as you could possibly could. <coughs> How close did you come with the enemy, like with the Germans? Close? Yeah, how close did you end up, like, the closest you ever got? Uh, the closest we got, uh, guns and all, uh, I believe was the U.S. What, what about that, the prisoners that you had, that you had to patrol? What, the prison, what do you mean, the prisoners? The, Remember the... Well, that was after the war. That was after the war. That was after the war. So then, we saw thousands of Germans because they were in the BW cages. And they were like the last six months. That, uh, that whole half of that last winter, 45, and right into the spring, they were quitting whenever they had the effort. So we saw a lot of them. We'd just take them and uh, like take their gun away from them. So we'd just take them and dump them. And we'd just throw them on the brick on the side of the road. Um, how did you feel when you found out that Italy had signed the armistice with the Allies? I think. Um, I think that we were signing the armistice. 
the Italians? Oh, the Italians? Yeah. Uh, that was before it was even in contact. That was? Yeah. And they didn't think much of it. Uh, <coughs> Mussolini became a hated man. Uh, but when we got to Italy and talked to the people, that's when we had an opportunity. So he did a lot of good so until he got tangled up with Hitler in the World War II. He, he was a tough, brutal man, but he did do a lot of good for the Italian people. Mm -hmm. Um, what did you talk about with your buddies, like, when you had free time? Free time? Did you guys do for home? Home. Talk about home? Mostly, yeah. Or the Italian girls. <laughs> yeah. Did you play cards or anything? Yes. Uh, they played a lot of cards and a lot of shot crap. Don't tell her you played cards. I didn't play cards. The group, I didn't play any cards. And uh, once in a while, I didn't understand the craft game very well. But I would sit alongside them, and I bet that when a man was rolling the dice, I bet that he made his, made it, you know, his crap, or he would miss, you know, whichever way I bet against him for the guy or for the dice. And sometimes uh, I never lost any money because we didn't have a hell of a lot. Um, did, you, did you write to your family? Oh, yes. Whenever I had okay. How did they feel about you being in the war? Well, they didn't like it, of course. But we used to write to them and tell them what up beautiful part of the country I was in, or what I had just seen, like Florence, or Naples, Rome, or any of the fabulous things that I would see, and describe them as best I could to them. When the weather was nice, I put them in and so i say, we're advancing on the Germans, and the, it's what's good that I can talk about. I tried to convince them that I wasn't in any serious danger. You were you were over there with your brother, right? Uh, my brother Jack uh, he enlisted about a year after me, I think, or maybe six months. But he went overseas with a, a replacement depot group. He made sergeant in the States, I believe in the States. And overseas, this group of men he had, he was with, uh, they received the recruits coming from America. They would receive them like in Naples at the docks, take them to wherever they were set up and uh, process them. Mm -hmm. And as the need came, they'd say, hey, we've got these five guys right here, they're going to the infantry, these guys are going to the artillery or uh, what have you. But they, that's what they did. They sent those men forward. And my brother was a sergeant in that group. And he went from Naples, he was Moved, they moved up. As we moved, they moved, of course, with us. Uh, but he, he moved to Rome. And while he was in Rome, they had a big turnover to where instead of sending uh, men with no experience, whatever, forward, take these people like my brother who had been there ship them into the, his replacement. Mm -hmm. And it looked, he wrote to me, and said, it looks like they're going to ship me, no doubt, into the infantry. So we got together, wrote together, said, why don't we try to get you shipped into my, my company? It's better than the infantry by a lot of means. And 
so that's what we did. I went to Mike Kernel at the Vegas to do that, who was a great guy, Colonel Lively. And he gave me a pass to go to Rome. So your brother tried to get things, and that's when we got this picture. When I went down to see Jack, but he was there. And uh, we, between my colonel and his commanding officer, whoever he was, they finagled things around, and finally we were in the north of Italy. And my brother got shipped, got transferred to us. And they, in his case, they just turned him loose. They said, you're in the 88th Division, uh, 338 Battalion. They're up north, go find them. And he did. He got out there, he thumbed his ride, and, and he got up and he joined, he joined me. Hello. And he got into my outfit the day before the war ended. So you guys were still in Italy when they dropped the atomic bomb on Japan? Oh, yes. How did you feel about that when you heard? Oh, we were pickled pink. So you were, you best were glad? Best thing ever happened, didn't happen. To this day, I believe it was. Okay. Because they saved so many lives. They took them off a lot of life. But they saved more than they took off of it. Um... Do you remember where you were when the war ended? In part of the It was in the north. I don't really remember. I was way north, in the north of the Pole River. Did you ever, did you ever feel like you couldn't go anymore? Like, did you ever get dis discouraged in battle or anything? Yeah. What was your motivation to keep going? Uh, it, it just, I, I didn't want to. I was scared of that, but I had to. Uh, just because the guy next to me had to. So we had to go together. That's what, about, I guess that's the easiest way to explain it. I don't know. A lot of times we didn't want no part of it, you know, have enough. But we were there and we were stuck with a tough shit. We live today. And we didn't know whether you're gonna be alive tomorrow or not, but you know, you did the best you could. Was it having your brother there, does that help? Did that help you get through it though? Knowing that he was Well, the war was over when he got there. Wrong. Yeah, but knowing that he was like well, over there with you. Well, we had a ball together, especially because the war was over. And we, you know, well, we were great together. You know, we had we could do things that those guys said, wow, these two bastards. <laughs> but they were me and Jack, you know, and then they didn't have anybody like I. We were lucky. How about the enemy today? When you think about the war, do you still feel like anything towards the Germans? Do you, like, no. Unhappy? Uh, being on the prisoner of war cages, uh, I think, took out of me. I don't know if that happened for everybody, but it took 90% of the bitterness out of the way I felt towards the Germans, because especially when we were on a PW cage uh, in Naples, it wasn't Naples, it was just north of, of Naples. Uh, and there we got to meet the, uh, the Germans who were like the carpenters, and the cooks and people like that. We go into their the prisoners' kitchen and have coffee and uh, roll or whatever happened to be available. 
And we got talking to the people like the cooks and the, the carpenters and people like that. And, you know, they explained uh, their predicament. They were just regular guys. And it was a case of uh, go in the army or be shot. And they, they didn't agree with him, especially when the war became of such a mess. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but think for some, most of those guys were regular fellows, like the colonel that gave me this knife. Yeah. They couldn't ask for a nice man. And Morris, very intelligent, well educated, good man. Um, what about when you went home? Were things different here? Did you feel like you had changed a lot? I felt, at uh, first, for a long time, I felt more that I had changed. And I was, uh, I don't know, I stayed home. I didn't, I didn't go anywhere. You know. It took me a couple of weeks before I would go out for downtown. You know, I went a little bit, like, but I remember the first few times I went up town from here. I wouldn't go unless my sister was I wouldn't go home. And just, I, I was, I, I, that I could, you can't really put words on it, but I felt strange. I felt unusual. She is the one. Well, I, uh, I talk right, well, I act right, because when we were in the Army, which was common phrase mm -hmm. and uh, using crazy phrases that the southerners used, you know, and, uh, things like that. It, was, uh, it be became the way we were talking there, we were living all the time. We got home, the, the sun changed and the cook changed, but it seemed uh, difficult for me. But it, like, I'm talking about a week or two weeks, ten days or something. After that, I um, I read in a book that John Steinbeck was a leader, right? And as a journalist. Did you ever meet him? Did you hear him? At that time, I never heard of him. Alright. Just me. Um. When uh, you were in the artillery, what um, were you issued? Like, what kind of guns did you guys use? Uh, they were 105 millimeter howitzers. How much did they weigh? They weighed, uh, there I thought I'd never forget. They weighed about a little bit better than two tops. Uh, I used to know right down to the pound. I know they had, uh, Long, constant, hydromatic, floating, piston-type recoil mechanism. That meant that when the gun fired, there was a tube on top of the gun, and there was fluid in it, oil. And the other, the other end of it was full of a gas. When the gun fired, the oil was, it was like a cylinder gun coming back like this, pulled that oil down, compressed it against that gas. Then the gas forced it back in, into battery. And that's how it, that's what it was. That was the way that gun was. The shell weighed 53 pounds. And it came in two sections. The brass, which wow. this was part of the brass. This is where the firing pin struck it, and that was about that long. And uh, there was 10 powder charges in it, and you, when you open the gun, the commands would be uh, shell, H-E, that would be uh, hard impact or something like that. I don't remember that, but H-E was the most normal shell that we used. 
other than that, it would be a time show, you know. And uh, I lost my point. Oh, the powder bags. It was ten powder bags. If you were close up, they'd say uh, charge three, or charge two. They were little bags like this. They were like bean bags. And you knew you were tight. You were up close when they went out like that because he was. I remember it was if it was a charge eight or nine or something. Oh, good, they're they're out of the way. That we were firing a long ways away. Depending on the, how far they had to fire, depending what how much we take the other shell, the other bags of powder, and just on the edge of the casing, break the string that held them together and throw the old powder off to one side. In the winter time, we used that wasted powder in our, we had like a four-man box all went stale every, we weren't moving. We'd go to a place where we could all get together. We had a stove made out of 50 gallon oil can, five, yeah, five gallon oil can. And that's what we would burn in it, is the gunpowder. Just feed it, throw it, just pull it at night. A couple sticks of wood if we could get it. Uh, it would be green if we cut it down the tree. Split it up real fine, stack it on top of the stove, and then let it dry. That makes you fire. Then we take the wood that was dry and put it into the fire pit. <coughs> I keep feeding the gunpowder and it would get hot enough to how many shells could you shoot a minute? How long did it take? Uh, the, the book says you could fire four shells a minute. Or, yeah, two shells a minute. Or four shells for, an, for a short period of time. At one time we fired 18 rounds per Fired five or six, six shells in 18 seconds. That was a trip. It's hard to do what we did. What we did, we would fire. We had the ammunition ready, right? We would fire the gun, and uh, you, you pull the rope the lane. And there was a trigger on it, right? And you fired it. The trigger arm was pulled toward <coughs> We had a block of wood. And we'd stick that right behind the trigger arm. <coughs> so when it went back into position, we'd have to load the gun awful fast. We had a good man to, to do it. And while it was in recoil, you would load the gun. As it went back into battery, it got about three quarters of the way into battery, it would fire again. We tore the gun apart for doing that. I know one time we ruined the, the uh, recoil mechanism. All the oil come out of it was like soap soaps. <laughs> we had to take it back to the uh, armament outfit. Get a new gun, get a different gun. Did you, um, you were, did you, were you there to, like, support the ground troops and give them cover when they moved? Like, that's, that was that's your job. job, right? As they would move, right, they had a four, we had a four old servers, one of our men and the children. And a group that would be, like, three of them at a time. They'd stay a couple of days, and then another group would go up with them. And they would observe where our shells landed in the infantry on the telephone. The infantry officers would tell them, we need fire, like on Gear Street. You know, we got a group pinned down on Gear Street. These are the coordinates you fire here and there. And the way we would work it, really, if you had the target, uh, say it was this house, right? Or if you were going 
in that direction. You'd fire one round. You'd fire until you got one round that would say, like, land up in my backyard by the small block. You get one over, then you fire one short, one right, and one left. And then they would say, fire for effect. My gun was a number two gun. My gun fired at the target until you got it pinpoint. Then when they said fire for effect, all six guns, which were making their same moves when my gun was moved, they would move identically to it. So all six guns were in the same on the same target. When they said fire for effect, all six guns fired. And they would say uh, two rounds per minute into a fire three mount, three rounds in five minutes or something. Then depending on what kind of coverage they needed, if it was real bad, just fire for effect and that kind of fire in the script so we get it. How did uh, you move your guns? Like when you moved off the line, did you pull my Jeep? No, two and a half ton truck. Two and a half ton truck? Yeah. And the truck would back up and the trails split like this. Two trails would go down and they were down on the ground. They had spades at the end of the new fire the first time. They would dig into the ground and kept it stable. If the ground wasn't stable, we had the rocks that we carried with us. We put them behind the, behind the space, so they come against that rock to hold, hold it in place. When we went to move, we pulled the, 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 the trails up and closed them. You had a lock on them, and you had a pinion that hooked into the trailer edge on the truck. It was up when it was firing. And when you just turned it over, and it was a black on it. Black at the place that turned it down when you looked in on the truck. And then the truck took us wherever we had to go. Came in years to get on the truck. Me and the driver and the cab. How did it take to set your gun back up after you like got to your position? Well, if we were going to move, unless it was in a terrible um, fluid situation, if it was a normal situation, we are going to move, like the, if we get orders, we are going to move in two hours. Unless the, sun, the six um, sergeant uh, of each gun, each section, would go on ahead with the staff sergeant who was number two gun normally, number one gun apparently. Uh, but them and the uh, lieutenant in charge of the, of the house, they would go forward and as they got near the, the place, say, all right, Collins, you go there, Smith goes there, Jones goes there, and so on. And what I had to do Never been there, of course, on the Saw Mountains. As we moved, I had to remember where I made uh, mental notes of uh, the countryside. To pull into this place, you'd be looking at the side, it's like looking at the side of the West Mountain, the West Mountain, you know, only bigger. And uh, I, I had to know that's where he pointed. So when he showed me that's where I went to go, I had to make a, pick out a tree or something, a rack or some goddamn thing that let me know where I had to go when I got there. Because when we approached that, that spot, we were turning off the road, whatever the road was, to go in, pop into it. We were on our own then get our gun in there and get it hooked up as quickly as possible. You pull in with your gun and the truck would turn around so the gun was heading back. I would walk out where I wanted my gun to be 
and I'd stand there and the, the driver would back the gun up, which was not an easy trip, especially in a rough going, until he hit me, hit me right in the face with the, with the muzzle of the gun. And I'd direct him, of course, you know, we had the hand signals, this way or that way, whatever, you know, and direct him as best we could. And, and he'd get as close as he could, then it was up to us. We did it by hand. A lot of times we moved him a long way, like a place like my backyard, was, or worse, with all the trees and rocks and everything on it, he was pulling the gun or pushing the two-ton gun through it with eight men. It's goddamn hard work. But we did it. Very seldom that we hit a spot where you couldn't get the gun where you wanted it. Then you do the best you could. You got it wherever, wherever you could because depending on how bad you were needed. If we need to fire right away, then you just pick the easy spot, the quickest spot and bang. Later on, if you were still there, you move the gun to a better spot. But that's the way we got him in there. When you say fluid situations, do you mean like rainy? What? You oh. said before you said fluid situations and no, situation. I mean the, the, uh, well, the Germans were know. attacking. <laughs> we were attacking. They were either, you know, uh, very fluid. We might be moving, or we might be backing up. Uh, okay. You never knew. That was a foolish situation. We didn't know what was, what was happening. Uh, which way it was happening, whether we had them on the run, or whether they were uh, counterattacking to where we had to make a turn to get things ready, because we may have to get the hell out of here. You know. But that would be a fluid situation. Okay. Fluid was all winter. The other fluid took a bit. From from October to April, right? Hey, almost every day. I believe that the uh, war had a lot to do with that. That it affected the weather. You know, the constant. Moment of uh, fire or smoke, but it going into the atmosphere and, and it changed things, you know, to mm -hmm. make it rain. You know, rain, but uh, they get a lot of rain as if they're just the same. But I think it was a little worse during the war here. Um, how do you feel about the war today in Iraq? It's the biggest mistake the country's ever made. there basically to get one man and to protect our oil interests. Uh, his looking for the weapons of mass destruction is a bunch of bullshit. I think he knew uh, the president knew there wasn't any, and, uh, but he used it as an excuse to get there. Uh, I don't think we should be there. No However, we're there. Do the job back the best we can. So you don't agree, but you support the troops? I'm, it's my country, and I'm going to do what they. I'm for it. I'm backing them, hoping we can get out of there quick. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's about all the time we have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. It's a pleasure. You can take this with you if you want to read it. I can read it? Huh? I can read it? Sure you can, if, right. you, if, if you'd like to. Definitely. And this is from Naples. It's a Rome. Casino, Anzio. Yep. Uh, Anzio. was a terrible blunder. And anybody that was on that beach is a tremendous hero. 
We broke through. We were the outfit yeah, that broke the through, that through to relieve those old bastards. You were in Rome too, right? Oh yeah, we went into Rome. How about the stuff in it? Your your gun was the first artillery piece in Rome, right? That's far as I know. I know. We always said that anyway, that we were the first in. And my gun was the first one through. So. <laughs> I remember the day we went into Rome and we pulled in and we're going through the city. Through the like this. And we're not into the main city yet. We're like uh, South Woods Squad, you know. Mm -hmm. but going through this street, and all of a sudden one of the guys says, Hey, sir, Jesus, look at And there was a German tank just about 50 feet down or 50 yards down the street from us, facing right at us with a gun level like this right at us. And I'm like, wow, you know, what the hell are we do now? We were stuck. There were trucks in front of us, but we couldn't go anywhere. Come to find out. It was just an abandoned tank. <laughs> there was nobody in it. You know? But it scared us, I'll tell you. Because There's an idea what your countryside was like. Some parts of it. This was the easy stuff. This was uh, just north of Naples, in that area. The mules, boy, they did. The mules? Did you get a mule? <laughs> no, <but> they, <laughs> most of them were, were run by the, uh, uh, by the Italians. Yeah. yeah, the Italian, actually they were Italian soldiers, but they switched to us, and that's what most of them did. They, they drove those mules. And I remember when a mule would get like hit with a shell or something, and they just take him, take all of them. The stuff that he was carrying off him, leave him up by the edge of the road. Of course, the road was all the way up on the mountain pass, you know. And they, they, one guy would shoot the, the mule, and the other guy would push him down the mountain and go. There's the other group of heroes. The engineers, the guys that put these bridges in, to cross the most of the time it was under fire across all the rivers we crossed. Most of them, that's the way we got crossed. And why it took a great outfit to put those things together. Like a big, that's 105. Yeah. I believe it is. Okay. That's why you have your camp. Huh? I think that's about you at your camp, your training camp. Oh, the Gruber? Right? Yeah. It's old. Oh, the date on it. February, Thursday, April 22nd, 1943. Here's a picture. <laughs> a little bit what they look like, the poor bastard. <laughs> Infantry. Those, that's the tubes that they came in when the shell came. Remember one place we were in, they used to send the ammunition up to us that came in. Three rounds on a pole, like you know, with a rod down the center. And they were in uh, cardboard, heavy cardboard tubes, and you'd have to take them all apart. And then they'd go like tape around the tubes to get the ammunition out of the ammunition in the cell in the center. 25 minutes before, Dave. One place we went 
Napoli were at, and that's where Mac was, and that's why Mac was killed. Uh, we were firing so often, and we were here with this black country around, around Siena, and uh, we just didn't have time to go around. We told the driver, tell those guys we went all the goddamn ammunition you can get on the truck, take it out of the containers completely, just to bear in there. They come up with, he's supposed to carry 200 rounds. He'd come up with five, six hundred rounds of ammunition just made it. And he'd pull in behind the ground, take down the tailgate, back up, and then slam the brakes on and all the ammo. Go pile it up, go plow. It's scary, but it worked. And we just take it from there. And a lot of times it was supposed to do it, but you would jam them. Come off like that, the casings would get bent. We'd load them in the, into the gun. They'd lack maybe that much of them. In. We had an eight pound sledgehammer. We just pounded it on the back end of it. If we hit it wrong, it was goodbye, but we, we took that chance, that's all. We drove them in with a hammer. That's how we loaded it. 